Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Emily, and I am the store manager of the Port Williams store um, in Nova Scotia. We are very excited to have you all here this evening for our webinar, All About Ticks. Uh, before we get there, though, uh, we have a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, throughout the call, participants will all be muted. There will be an opportunity pro to provide your comments and your questions during our question and answer period at the end. We'll have the chat box open throughout the entire presentation, so feel free to write in your questions via the chat box. During the Q&A period, Nicoletta will be able to answer them, time permitting. We also have some great prize giveaways. Uh, if you're registered, no worries, you are automatically entered in to win. Uh, the winners will be contacted via email tomorrow, Wednesday, June 23rd, by the end of the day. Uh, so be sure to check your inboxes. The prizes that we have this evening are three, three great little tick bundles uh, that include a $10 Feeds and Eats gift card, a tick twister, and a one bottle of Atlantic tick spray. Uh, so with us tonight, we have Dr. Nicoletta Ferrone, who is an assistant professor at the chemistry department at Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. She teaches biochemistry and natural, natural product chemistry. Her research focuses on studying tick chemosensory system, how ticks detect odors from hosts, and how they respond to repellents. She designs and develops novel essential oil-based tick repellent products, such as Atlantic's. So without further ado, please welcome Nicoletta. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emily and Elena, for, for this amazing job that you guys did to put together this event. Um, so I am Dr. Nicoletta Parone. I am an assistant professor uh, of biochemistry at Acadia University Chemistry Department. I am a natural product chemist uh, by training. And I worked, and I have a PhD in um, in chemical ecology. Now, during my studies, um, I I work with insects mostly, uh, using um, natural product um, as an active ingredient. And they have uh, natural products in general. They have a lot to offer, and they can provide useful biological activities to control pests. Now, my journey in science uh, brought me to work with ticks, and then I became a tick buster. So this picture was actually, uh, was taken, uh, now it's about three years ago in 2018, uh, and it was in my home bay. So I have pointed out here the little map. Uh, it's a beautiful area in the Southeast of Nova Scotia. Uh, which unfortunately is very much infested uh, with ticks. So we were, we were there with my students uh, for sampling ticks using a method called the dragging method. But I will tell you more about that uh, during the course of this presentation. Um, so this, this was a very nice experience. Also, um, I was there working together with Lisa Ali, the founder of Atlantic Repellent Product. And also, I will tell you more about my collaboration with Atlantic later on. But let's start here. And um, so I hope from these today's seminars, uh, you will become a tick expert. So um, in today's seminars, we'll focus on different aspects. And I hope that at the end, you will be able to identify ticks, knowing more about their exciting life cycle, understanding Lyme disease and learning about how ticks sense us so how they can detect us basically and our pets and other potential hosts and also i will give you an overview of different repellent products and related active ingredient that are on the market they're available on the market and you can buy at feet and needs so but first of all we need to try to differentiate and understand how what are ticks. So here I put together different types of arthropods. So, and uh, we need to be able to distinguish ticks from other pests if we want to call it really pest. So here we have a tick, then we have a bumblebee, then we have a lovely June bug that I'm sure many of you really like it. We have an ant and then we have a spider. Now look at these pictures here. And can you see the main difference among the species that we have? 
And I want to give you a little help. Just look at the number of legs that these different species have. You can see June bugs has a six legs, the ants has a six, also the uh, bumblebee. But spider and ticks, they actually have eight legs. So ticks basically are not insects, but they belong to the same class of the spider. So they are occurrence. And this is, can be a good indication for us when we encounter something that looks like tick, but it might be not. So just count the number of legs. Now, going more in the specific, we need to be able to understand the ticks that are out there and those that are mostly uh, interesting for us because they carry a pathogen that can cause different types of disease. Now, the main one there are in North America, they're very common in North America, are uh, three types of ticks. The Lone Star tick, the um, uh, American dog tick, and the Black Leg tick. Now, here we have uh, the uh, Lone Star tick, or Amblyoma americanum. Now, this tick is um, not still detected in Nova Scotia. However, there have been uh, some uh, non confirm um, observation, but it's been located in Ontario. This tick it was called a lone star because the female has this nice white spot in the middle that recalls us like the, um, the lone star in the Texas flag because this, this tick is actually coming from Texas. Now, it's present in Western Canada and Southeast USA, and like I said, has not been detected yet. In Nova Scotia. Now this is very aggressive. Uh, it really runs and uh, it can be one of the most aggressive ticks that bites humans. The adult females, so it's distinguished by this nice red, uh, nice white spot here. Um, and you can see has is quite different from another species, very, very common here in all North America. It is called Dermacentron variabilis or American dog ticks. And I'm sure you have encountered lots of these ticks when you go for a hike, for a walk, or on your dogs and your and your cats and your pets. This is really common. And um, you can see um, that the female and the males are pretty much different because they have a different pattern on their body. Now, the greatest risk of being bitten by this tick, the American dog tick, occurs usually during the spring and summertime. And adult females are most likely to bite humans. And I will tell you that about this a little bit later, but usually um, are the female ticks that are responsible to bite humans because they seek for a blood meal in order to have the enough energy to, um, uh, to lay eggs and uh, um, uh, have many baby ticks. But the other species that is most, I would say, important for us, and because it's the species that carries the pathogen that causes Lyme disease, is the black leg tick, or Ixodis scapularis. Now, the greatest risk of being beaten by these ticks exists in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall in Northeast, Upper Midwest, and Mid-Atlantic. So basically all year long. And I would say that um, huddle ticks may be out searching for hosts any time of the winter when winter temperatures are above freezing, so above four degrees Celsius. So this, this means that you should never have, never uh, lower your guard against ticks and always check for ticks after the, you are spending time outdoors or you have your dogs uh, taking out for walks or your cats are outdoor cats. Now, all life stages of this tick, they can be humans, but nymphs, which are represented here, uh, and adult females, which is this, this one, are most commonly found in people. Well, the adult male, they don't bite because in their final stage, they will basically just mate with the female, usually while she while she is attached to host uh, to a host, and then 
she's actively feeling. So if you look at them all together, you can see, and this picture I put together in a way that you can see the size difference between them. And the, um, the black leg tick or deer tick is actually a little bit smaller than the American dog tick. And uh, what it's interesting to notice is that um, the, uh, when they are engorged, uh, meaning when they, 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 they have a blood meal, they can reach, they can become 200 times bigger than the unfed ones. So they look like a big bean compared to the, the, small, the small tick, uh, to the unfed tick. So, um, and here I have reported uh, the different uh, um, disease that they can, they, they can vector. Uh, so the black leg tick is responsible for Lyme disease, as well as anaplasmosis and babayosis. The American dog tick is responsible to transmit the pathogen causing the Rocky Mountain spot fever and tularemia, while the lone star tick is also responsible for this list. And I'm sure you heard about the so-called meat allergy, because apparently when um, uh, people uh, are exposed to a tick bite from a lone star tick, they develop uh, an allergy to meat. So they have, um, um, they cannot eat meat anymore. So, and here I want to show you an actual nice picture that uh, one of my students uh, took using an instrument called SCM. It means uh, scanning electron microscopy. So it's um, a powerful tool to have a really good close up of the specimen that you are studying. So here we have a female engorged of a black leg tick and an unfed female. And you can see here, there is this part of the body called the scutum. And you can see how different in size is here because this the stick here is engorged and present a very big enlargement of the uh, lower body. In, in fact, like I mentioned before, they can expand up to 100 times the original size. Now, ticks are very fascinating. I found them really fascinating to study. However, they represent a big problem, especially for Nova Scotia. In fact, um, the emergency, uh, the emergence of vector-borne disease in Canada, and particularly Lyme disease, which is caused by the pathogen uh, called uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, is um, linked very much by the spread of black leg ticks. Um, so in those maps that I, I reported here to show you, they basically present the um, the estimated areas in Nova Scotia of contracting Lyme disease from a tick bite. So the darker spot represent the counties where the risk is highest uh, is higher. So you can contract Lyme disease from a tick bite, and you can see that from March 2017 uh, to March 2020, basically all the counties in Nova Scotia are classified as a higher risk. Now, we don't have data for March 2021 because pandemic happened and uh, it was not really possible to uh, do a survey uh, for this. But you can clearly see that here, all Nova Scotia is represented basically a high um, risk area to contract in Lyme disease. So let's say, have then a little bit of look at the um, life cycle of black leg ticks. So usually the uh, life cycle of a deer tick of black leg tick it expand over two years and we have different stages. So we have the egg, six legged larva, then we have an eight legged nymphs and the adults at the end. And I have uh, put it in bold this too because these two stages, the eight leg uh, nymphs and the adults, are those most responsible to transmit the pathogen causing Lyme uh, because they actively bite and feed on humans. So the egg, basically, you can see here in the representation, the eggs are usually hatching in the spring 
and they become tick larvae. So the larvae are uninfected with the disease until they take a blood meal from an uninfected host animal, mostly during the summer months, and they can feed them birds and small animals. Then in the fall, these larvae fall off the host and prepare to be dormant in the winter. Um, so they basically go in a dormant state and then they wake up again in the spring in the form of nymphs. Now, nymphs become active in the spring, so as soon as the temperature rises and the snow melts, and may already be infected with the disease, so including Lyme. And nymphs take a blood meal in the spring and summertime, so usually it's, um, in, it's in, in this part that we and our pets are most vulnerable to be exposed to a tick bite. And the main problem is that because nymphs are so small, the size of a poppy seed, so think about it, they often go undiscovered for the 36 to 48 hours that Lyme disease need to transmit from tick to humans. But then uh, over the summer, after they um, get the blood meal, they become adults and adults are usually active in the fall and winter months. And adults have a high chance of carrying infectious diseases since they have been exposed to blood meals from two different hosts. So here we have basically the two species compare and you can see how small the nymphs can be. So they are tiny, less than two millimeter and very difficult to see. So they feed during the spring and summer months. Now, um, Lyme disease I mentioned can be spread through the bite of uninfected ticks, but ticks must be attached for at least 34 to 48 hours or more before the Lyme disease bacterium can be transmitted. So um, I would say if you have a tick bite, if you have a tick attached on you, don't panic. Um, you need to still remove the tick and save the tick for testing. Uh, call your doctor and look him for, uh, be, caref be careful and um, monitor yourself for potential symptoms. Um, but if you do your tick check right after you've been outside for a hike or for a walk, uh, you can be really reduce the potential time of exposure and you can be safe. But still, if you have a tick attached on you, you need to talk to your doctor and you need to uh, test the tick to make sure that um, uh, potentially has Lyme or not. Now, as I mentioned, most humans are infected through uh, the bites of immature ticks like nymphs, um, but you can be also exposed by the bites of adult ixodes ticks, which are most active during the cooler months of the year. So, Ticks like very much humid, uh, warm environment, but during the very, very hot summer months where there is a low humidity and uh, um, the temperature is very high, the chances that adults will be around, it's, it's, um, it's little. You are more likely to be exposed in the spring and in the fall. So talking about tick check, and uh, be careful then to reduce your risk. There are different, um, I would say, good practices that are important when uh, you come back from a hike or from an outdoor activities. And I took this information from the Nova Scotia website that I recommended if you wanna know more and if you wanna be updated about news, just go on government certified website. When they pro where they provide certified sources of information. So a uh, good practice is for sure wearing long pants and long sleeves in the area likely to have ticks. Wear light color clothing because it's easy it's easier to see ticks on you. Uh, wearing clothes shoes and uh, tuck your pants into your socks. So it's not very fashionable, but for sure it will save you uh, to get in contact with ticks. Um, also, walk on well-traveled paths, avoiding long grass and vegetation, 
an applied insect repellent or tick repellent product containing DEET, containing picaridine, containing essential oil, whatever you choose, but it's important you protect yourself and you're aware about the risk that you can encounter when you go outdoors and you might be in contact with ticks. When you check for ticks, you need to check yourself and your family for ticks and as well as your pets after being outside. So a good practice is having a bath or a shower uh, within two hours of coming, coming inside uh, because it makes easier to spot ticks and wash off and attach ticks because ticks like warm places on the body. So remember to check around the ears, behind knees, in the hair, between the legs, groin area, around the waist. And if you see a tick attached on you, remove it safely. There are different types of tools and uh, I will show you later. There are nice uh, tick twisters that you can get feed the, feed the needs um, that will remove safely the ticks. And uh, make in general, and if you, if you have pets that spend time outside, make tick checks part of your daily routine. Now, dogs can't, they cannot transmit tick-borne illness to people, but ticks are hitchhikers. In fact, they can enter your home on your pet and move to your, uh, to you or another family member. So <clears throat> um, it's important to check your pets. And one good practice is when you go back from uh, an outdoors activity or hike, just uh, put clean and dry outdoor clothes in a dryer on a high heat for at least 10 minutes to kill any remaining ticks. So I put together here some uh, interesting facts uh, about black leg tick and Lyme disease, just to um, give you a more clear overview and information about ticks and Lyme disease. So first of all, there is no evidence that Lyme disease is transmitted from person to person. For example, a person cannot get infected from touching, kissing, or having sex with a person who has Lyme disease. Untreated Lyme disease uh, during pregnancy can lead to infection of the placenta. Now, spread from mother to fetus is possible, but rare. Now, fortunately, with appropriate antibiotic treatment, uh, there is no increased risk of the birth, uh, birth, birth outcomes. But there are no published studies assessing developmental outcomes of children uh, whose mother acquired Lyme disease during pregnancy. So this is still a very, very um, new area of research and there are lots of uh, scientists that are spending time to try to clarify all these questions, to answer all these questions. Now, although no cases of Lyme disease have been linked to blood transfusion, scientists have found that Lyme disease bacteria can live in blood that is stored for donation. So individuals being treated for Lyme disease with an antibiotic should not donate blood. And individuals who have completed antibiotic treatment for Lyme disease may be considered as a potential blood donor. So, what about dogs then? So although dogs and cats can get Lyme disease, there is no evidence that they spread the disease directly to their owners. However, as I mentioned before, pets can bring infected ticks into your home or yard. So consider protecting your pets and possibly yourself through the use of tick control products and animals. And you can find many of those products at Feed the Needs. Now, you will not get Lyme disease from eating, for example, squirrel meat or wild animals meat, but in keeping with general food safety principle, always cook meat very thoroughly. And note that hunting and dressing deers or squirrel may bring you into close contact with infected ticks. So um, be always mindful and careful when you are in the woods. Now, there is no credible evidence that Lyme disease can be transmitted through air, food, or water, or from the bite of a mosquito, fly, fleas, or lice. So it's just ticks, and particularly not all the ticks. 
just the black leg tick. In fact, ticks uh, like the lone star tick and the American dog tick, uh, they are not known to transmit Lyme. So um, we need to be mindful, particularly for Lyme, uh, for the black leg tick. Now, for our dogs, so um, the, um, the disease is transmitted to humans and dogs by meats and other stages of the black leg tick. Now, dogs may develop Lyme disease from the bite of a black leg tick, which may transmit the bacteria uh, that uh, is known as Borrelia burgdorferi. Now, once ill, dogs can become feverish and lame in one or more joints. They also may exhibit a sluggish and their lympho nodes may swell. Now, there is a deadly manifestation of Lyme disease in dogs that is called Lyme nephritis, and it's, fatal, uh, it's a fatal side effect that causes the animal kidney to fail. And researchers have a strong suspicious, suspicion that labs and golden retrievers are predisposed. However, there is always uh, the, the, your dog can be safely treated, and uh, just with a proper course of antibiotic, uh, antibiotics, uh, uh, the disease can be eradicated and your dog can get back healthy. And what about cat? And actually I put a picture of my cat here. So Lyme disease occurs much more frequently in dogs than in cats, um, but cats can also get Lyme disease. So when infected, Cats may show similar symptoms that are observed in dogs, such as lameness, fever, loss of appetite, fatigue, or, for example, difficult breathing. Now, Lyme disease can also affect the kidneys, joints, nerve system, and heart, but these occur in a very rare cases. Many cats, usually they, don't, they do not show noticeable signs, despite being infected, and um, in infection uh, typically occurs after the uh, pathogen carrying tick has been attached to the cat for at least 18 hours. So again, a good practice is um, uh, protecting your cat with proper tick repellent product that are suitable for, for, for your pet, for your cat, and do your tick check. Now, although a vaccine is available to protect dogs against Lyme disease, no such vaccine has been developed for cats. However, a cat can be protected to an extent, uh, to an extent during warm weather by using a cat safe insect repellent before it goes outdoors. And again, um, you can use still anti, you can treat your cat with antibiotics uh, if there is the case of an infection. But what happens if you get a tick bite? Uh, well, so first of all, as I mentioned before, you don't need to panic. Um, first thing it's important to do is remove the tick. Uh, and there are specific kit to remove it. And these uh, tick tweezers are good because they will make you sure that you don't squeeze the tick because you don't want to that what's inside the tick get into your bloodstream. And you need to have a proper tick removal kit uh, because of the way how the mouth part of tick is made. So here I have a picture uh, that I one of my students took uh, with a very fancy tool called SEM, the scanning electron microscopy. So this is a nymph, so it's a very close caption of, of the nymph mouth part. And you can see that the mouth part here, so this is the, 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 the mouth and these two are the palps, has a very seared uh, line meant to be anchored very strongly onto your skin. So if you pull it out too fast, the head of the tick will stay attached in your skin. That's why you need to use a proper tick twister. Now, once you remove safely your tick, you can need to save the sample. And I will recommend to save the sample in the freezer and send it for testing. Now, if you want to get your tick testing, there are different options. Uh, one that um, uh, I can recommend 
it's sending the sample to Lloyd's lab. I collaborate with Dr. Beth Lloyd. Uh, she's an expert in, uh, um, in vector, um, in vector uh, pathogens, and uh, um, she's located at Mount Allison University. Here I put the website for you. Uh, and you can send your sample to her and it will be tested to see if there is the pathogen causing Lyme disease. What is interesting about testing and uh, linking the um, number of tested ticks and the number of Lyme disease cases is that only three or four percent of cases of Lyme disease have been detected in Canada. And this is means that basically uh, are not proper um, tick testing have been performed in order to associate and link Lyme disease cases to actually infected ticks. Because based on the number of, for example, infected dogs and ticks, the number of Canadians who have Lyme disease should be much higher than the official reports. And in this, the, the main problem is also because Lyme um, uh, presents on people in different form. Uh, with different symptoms, and sometimes it's hard to uh, detect uh, specifically the disease. And um, so we should have a better training also to inform better our medical system about all the symptoms and how to treat properly Lyme, because it can be a very debilitating and life-threatening disease. And many, many people in Canada, they are um, they suffer about, of, of, of this disease. So now a good way to protect us uh, against ticks. So we have talked about basically the different species of ticks, the life cycle, how they um, uh, would cause and what's Lyme disease. We need to find a way, of course, to protect us, which is not just uh, do our tick check. and. Uh, to avoid tick bite is actually um, a good approach is understanding how ticks detect us. So how tick, ticks are able to spot potential hosts and like us and our pets. And this is basically the focus of my research program. So I try to understand how ticks find their host. So first of all, ticks cannot fly or jump, but instead, they like to hang it out. They wait for a host to pass by. They're just hanging on uh, shrubs and uh, tall grass, uh, resting on their on the tips of grasses and shrubs in a position known as a questing. So when they extend their four legs here, it's called the questing. Now, while questing, ticks hold onto leaves and grass by their lower legs, and uh, uh, they hold their pair of legs outstretched, waiting to climb onto a passing host. And when a host brushes the spot where the tick is waiting, it quickly climbs abroad. So it then uh, the tick will be looking for a suitable place, a place to buy its host. So one thing that's interesting to notice about tick, that there is also another fascinating aspect about them, so ticks are almost totally blind, so they cannot really see very well, um, and they cannot see us, but they can smell us, and they have a very, very unique and um, olfactory system. So they uh, ticks rely very much on olfaction, and they use a unique organ called Haller's organs that is located just on the tip of their four tarsi here. And this is another uh, close picture here, like a close caption of the Allers organs. Um, that is able to detect the molecules that are coming from the host. So it can be, if you think about it, like a tick nose. Now, they are particularly sensitive and attracted to carbon dioxide. So when we exhale, uh, they like uh, sweat and body odor ammonia odor, like pee odor, uh, and they can, um, and you can understand that ticks dislike other odors um, that are repelled to. So they like our smell, but they don't like 
essential oils, for example. So there are specific odors that they dislike and they induce repellency. Now, an important part of my research uh, is dedicated to develop tick repellent product. Um, and the development is of tick repellent product is based on understanding how ticks detect odors. So this idea gave me the opportunity to work with an amazing woman, Lisa Ali, here in the picture, which is the founder of Atl Atlantic Repellent Product. Now, together with another professor at Acadia, Dr. Kirk Hillier, uh, in the biology department, and thanks also, also to the support of different funding bodies, particularly Ken Lyme, which is the Canadian Lyme Disease Foundation. Um, I worked, and I'm still working closely uh, with Atlantic to study ticks, and developing effective and environmentally friendly um, product. Uh, they can be safely applied and can protect us against tick bite. So the, um, we did some exciting field work to monitor tick population and test the products in field conditions. So here are my two students. They're doing the uh, tick dragging method. So we are basically brushing the vegetation with a white cloth so we can spot the ticks that they will hang in there and they will get attached to it the uh the the, the white cloth um so this is gave us more or less an idea about the the, the tick population that there is in nova scotia and this is was done in a lunenburg area but for our lab test we use infection free blacklead ticks so basically we buy, we purchase ticks from a tick rearing facility lab located in US. So yes, you got, our, you got that right. There is a lab in US that actually sells ticks. And I can tell you they are really expensive. One of them, it costs five US dollars. So think about it. <laughs> um, so once we had the tick, uh, we wanted basically to measure if and how much ticks can smell specific volatile molecules. And to do so, we have developed a system which is based on electrophysiology, uh, where we basically, we hook the tick nose, so remember here the other solvent, to an electrode, and we measure the electrical activity of the tick when she's exposed to a certain stimulus. Now, among the tested chemicals, I have also measured the tick responds to molecules that tick, ticks like, like the smell, for example, of stinky feet, and molecules that ticks don't like, such as essential oil. So here I have actually a pretty video that I'm going to play for you. So you can see here we tested basically the behavioral tick response to this compound using a lab bioassay. So here I tested some of the Atlantic products, and we applied the um, Atlantic tick repellent product here. And you can see that the ticks are basically confined inside this area. So they are not going to cross because they are repelled. So this is, was a type of bioassay that we have developed to assess the efficacy of the product. And currently we are working to improve the existing product the, the existing formula because we wanted to have, um, uh, we want to extend the longevity of the, uh, the repellent product. And we are in the process to uh, submit the application uh, to Health Canada for the final registration. So we're very happy that we uh, are going to, very, very, we are very, very close to the final stage of our project. And we've been all over the place. So we're pretty famous. We've been featured on the CBC News, on the Chronicle Herald. So it's nice to see that uh, our work has been appreciated and recognized. Now, talking about the active ingredient, there are different products on the market uh, with ticks um, and mosquito repellent properties. And they are all valuable because they protect us against tick bite. So again, whatever you choose, um, if it's synthetic or if it's a uh, um, natural base repellent, uh, please protect always yourself, wear a tick repellent product and make sure you do your tick check. 
Now, what are the active ingredient used in the majority of tick repellent products? So here I will give you an overview on those containing some of the products that you can find in feeds and needs shops. Now, imidacloprid, it's a synthetic active ingredient that you can find in Advantix product. And this is a systemic insecticide that acts as an insect neurotoxin. Uh, it belongs to the class of chemicals that are called neonicotinoids. Maybe you heard about that. Uh, and basically what it does, uh, act on the central nervous system of insect and ticks. Permetrin is a, uh, in the pyrethroid family of medication. Uh, these are essential chemically stabilized form of natural pyrethrum. And one thing that you need to remember is that permetrin is toxic to cats. So, and it doesn't have though any effect on dogs. So uh, make sure that um, when you apply permetrin on your dog, your cat is not around. Now, permetrin also has a high toxicity to aquatic organisms. So make sure you don't pour the product on your, um, uh, on your sink. Now, pyrethrin are also another class of organic compounds normally derived from pyrethrum plants. So similar to permetrin. And they naturally uh, occur in chrysanthemum flowers. And usually they're often considered an organic insecticide when it's not combined with a piperonyl butoxide. It's something that you can find here, actually. Piperonyl butoxide is present in, um, in this product here called Zodiac. So this piperonyl butoxide is basically a catalyst that will enhance the activity of pyrethrin. Then we have uh, um, picaridine, which uh, picaridine that was created in the 80s. And it's another synthetic compound that is derived from plant extract uh, from the genus Piper. And basically it's the same plant, um, is the, the same plant genus that produces the table pepper. And then we have essential oils, which are natural. Now, there is a growing body of evidence indicating the potential value of essential oils as control agents against a range of arthropod ectoparasites, particularly lice, mites, and ticks. However, the, if you take the essential oil alone, they have a very volatile nature. So this suggests that their residual activity is likely to be short-lived. That's why there are specific formulations developed to improve and increase the longevity of essential oil-based products. Now, I hope that I give you a clear overview of the active ingredient. And I also wanted to show you something because I think that misinformation is very much out there and you need to be mindful when you search for information uh, and you want to compare, you know, different ideas and different sources. So I found here a website um, that uh, really provided that not correct information. So this is tick safety. Now they are posting do essential oil repel ticks. Well, they are saying that they provide, um, they are not providing a, a good protection, but the things that is mostly a uh, puzzle myth is here because they say that ticks that can actually smell and instead rely on primarily on eyesight and sensor in their first two legs, which can sense CO2. Well, this is a total, this is not true because ticks, they actually can smell and they detect CO2 because of the olfactory, uh, the olfactory system that is located on their two legs, two front legs. So, um, Ticks can absolutely smell. And I can tell you there are lots of papers. This is, I just put a, a batch of them, some of them published by our group and others that are available. There are several articles published on scientific journal we, where this was proven that ticks are able to detect volatiles and they are repelled by natural products like essential oils. And when I say the research is, be, is published on scientific journal means that the work has been peer reviewed by experts in the field 
and carefully analyzed and cross-checked for accuracy and for being scientifically sound. So it was not from a random website or from a post on Facebook from a friend of a friend. So be always mindful when you search for your sources of information. Now, in conclusion here, uh, I hope that I give you a good overview of ticks and Lyme disease. So we need to be aware of the presence of ticks. We need to wear proper clothes and repellent products because it would be a good way to protect ourselves against a tick bite. Protect your pets. Do always your tick check after outdoor activities and remove when if you have a tick bite, if you have a tick on you, remove your tick and save it for testing. Talk always to the, your doctor if you have a tick bite and seek for medical advice uh, and rely only on certified sources of information, for example, government website or scientific studies. So with this, I want to thank again, Elena and Emily uh, to organize this and to put together this nice event. Uh, I wanted to thank my lab, my students here, that they really are a source of inspiration when we work uh, on the natural products and we do research on ticks uh, and all the funding agency that are supporting my work. And thank you all of, all of you for your attention and um, there are, I'm open for questions and there are three prizes that uh, Emily mentioned before. So three small Atlantic spray uh three tick twisters and a ten dollar gift card so i'm gonna stop sharing and i'll pop back on nicoletta thank you so much that was fantastic um we have some questions that we will answer and uh the first one, um, well, apart from saying hello and thanking you for being uh, here and doing this, uh, the first question is, how do I attach a picture of a tick for identification? So um, there is actually a nice app, um, iTick, uh, that was developed by, if I recall correctly, there is a, my, uh, my collaborator, it's Dr. Kirk Hillier and uh, also Dr. Uh, Dave Shapler and there are other people uh, involved in this process. Uh, so there is a, an app called iTIC that you can download it and you can take a picture of your phone and you will have the um, uh, tick ID for you. Perfect. Um, next question from N Courage. Uh, can you recommend a single all purpose topical repellent for ticks, mosquitoes, and black flies? Thank you. So, um, in general, all the active ingredients that I have listed, um, and there is, of course, also DEET, um, these are good for repelling mosquitoes and ticks. So, they work more or less um, well for all the um vector parasites that are annoying us when we go outdoors and of course also essential oils what i recommend is when you buy a product just make sure to read the label and to see the uh, recommended frequency of application because some products are required to be applied more frequently than others also some of them can be applied directly on the skin or others on uh, on your clothing uh, but more or less they are working well both for ticks and for mosquitoes and black flies great um susan wall has asked how prevalent are they in new brunswick and why are there no human shots like there are for dogs and cats so i know that in new brunswick uh, they uh, there is also like a well-established uh, um, tick population for uh, the black leg tick. Uh, so it's also an odd spot for uh, finding uh, ticks that may carry the pathogen and cause Lyme disease. So in terms of the the um, uh, the vaccine, there is actually a vaccine in uh, in development. Uh, there was initially one called the Limerix that was um, on the market and then was withdrawn 
uh, was registered through the FDA and then was withdrawn because of some side effect. But currently, there's another new vaccine. I don't recall the name, but it was purchased by Pfizer and now is going through clinical trials. So hopefully, uh, in the upcoming years, so we will have a vaccine for Lyme disease for humans. Great. Um, so our next question is from Tina, and she says, uh, basically, if you if a host is sweating, there is a higher risk of having a tick on the person who is sweating. Yes, and also mosquitoes. Yeah, because I mean, they are really sensing the um, body odors, so they can be attracted by uh, your your body odor. So there is a chance that you might be more exposed potentially. Great. Um, this one comes in from Andrea. Uh, your two maps, two, two, oh my goodness, 2017 versus 2020 showed a significant increase in the number of black leg ticks. Is mm -hmm. this increased because ticks are becoming more common or might it have uh, been because there has been more monitoring being done? Um, they are becoming more uh, uh, common, I would say, and uh, this is a different factor. I mean, the um, the uh, the studying takes and uh, uh, has been uh, done by many years. There are different research groups that are studying and monitoring the presence of ticks in Canada um, and in Nova Scotia. The problem, the main problem, is that uh, um, I would say the link with Lyme disease created more awareness and uh, more um, interest in checking the presence of ticks in our province and also factors like uh, climate change, global warming, uh, the um, increment, um, the increase of the deer population, uh, there are presence like they are carrying, they are, they are carrying ticks around have also helped to increase substantially and significantly the uh, tick population uh, and ticks that are carrying mine. That's great. Not great, but that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, this question comes in from Cindy. Uh, do you recommend essential oils over synthetic products as repellents? So it depends uh, what you um, what you want or what you're looking for. Um, I use essential oil. I use product. I use Atlantic product. Uh, um, well, because I'm partially like involved in the process, right? Um, and I, um, like I mentioned before, I'm very careful in uh, applying uh, um, as the label recommend to make sure that my uh, that I'm covered and I'm protected. Um, Honestly, I try to avoid deep-based product because when I apply it on my clothing or my shoes, I see that they kind of melt and they damage my my clothing. So, you, as long as you wear tick repellent, it's it's your choice which product, but always wear tick repellent and that will protect you against tick bite. Perfect. Uh... This one is from Karen Troy. Is the Atlantic spray safe to use on dogs? Yes, it is. Yes, you can apply on uh, on dogs. Maybe maybe um, um, better to try a little bit, a small amount before to um, accustom the dog to the smell because it might be too strong. But you can apply on dogs. And we usually recommend not on cats at the store level because it carries uh, witch hazel which is toxic or ta cats just don't enjoy it. One of the yeah, two. Yeah, and the, the smell is too strong. Cats mm -hmm. have a very more uh, sensitivity uh, on, the, on the product, yeah. Great. Um, Margaret wants to know if there is evidence of other tick-borne diseases in Atlantic Canada. Um, I mean, the, the Rocky Mountain spotted fever is transmitted by the American dog tick. So I would say there there are, but um, the the main one is the one um, is Lyme disease because of the presence of 
the exposure to tick bite and uh, the um, uh, the symptoms that are causing and the uh, the difficulties to to treat the disease. So, um, Donna is asking: Can ticks fall from tree branches above onto you, or do they actually have to brush onto you? The Americ the black leg tick, they usually brush onto you because they are usually staying in uh, higher vegetation. So when you when you walk by, I mean, if you have a tree branches, it might be possible that they are getting on the, the tree branches, but they don't just fall from. You need to pass by and you need to, you know, get in touch with the vegetation in order for them to um, get it to you. At least this is for the black leg tick. Well, the American dog tick are a little bit more active, so they can kind of crawling over you. So, right. Um, Carrie asks, is there a specific essential oil that works best, or it is a, a combination of certain oils together? And this is what I'm trying to study. So there are a specific combination, but most of all is the the, the um, molecule is the mixture of the oil that makes the difference. So um, I've studied and treated different oils. So I would say lemongrass, um, lemon eucalyptus. Um, um, these are one of the, the, the most common essential oils. They've been proved and tested. They've shown good tick repellent activity. And um, they're also. Um, safely to use on humans because you know there are lots of other natural products out there they have a very valuable tick repellent or a carisidal activity but unfortunately might be toxic add to humans at the active dosage so that, that's why like part of my research is trying to figure it out uh, uh, what is the active concentration to have a safe product uh, that will still give us protection against ticks. Right, and they smell nice. <laughs> yes, and they smell nice, yes. <laughs> um, Andrea is asking, what is the latest research on vaccines for Lyme? Uh, where is the research being done? So like I mentioned before, uh, there is a, a vaccine in, uh, in development and right now it's going on clinical trial. Um, so hopefully we will have uh, vaccine for humans soon. Otherwise, one thing that is recommended it's if you uh, if you have a tick bite and then you are um, it's possible that has Lyme that the tick needs to be tested and you need to go to your doctor that will uh, uh, get the right prescription. Usually, it's a, a course of antibiotic will do the job and. Don't forget that we still have our immune system that is protecting us against uh, potential transmission. So, and again, the transmission of Lyme disease of the bacteria uh, usually occurs between 36 and 48 hours after the tick is attached on you and start feeding. So there is some time that at least you have time to do your tick check and remove the tick. Great. Um, so I'm going to switch gears here. We had some um, participants email in uh, prior to our live presentation with some questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there was this one customer um, and they said, I'd like some opinions or thoughts on EM, which stands for Effective Microorganism Callers. I have been using them for three years and found one tick on my dog last year, knowing that nothing is 100% effective against this pest. I'd like to know your thoughts on these EM collars um, and if they are the way to go in order to stay chemical free. So uh, the, it depends very much about how long the collars was wear by, I guess, the dog and um, if there was any um like so, sometimes it's it's very difficult to, to i mean you can protect your dog wearing all this product and so on but it's also good practice to do a tick check in general so these are valuable products that are still give you a certain degree of protection but it's been also observed that uh, can be that ticks might develop some resistance 
so they become resistant to the active ingredient, even to the strongest and to the uh, most powerful one. So what I would say, make sure you use fresh and new products and you do your tick check also on your, in your pets. Great. Um, Julie B uh, emailed in and asked, um, are ticks more active when uh, things are dry or wet? When they're wet. They like a humid, um, humid environment. So they are more active and they're more responsive in a humid environment. So in a very hot summer day, um, or usually in an uh, area where the, um, the, uh, your, your lawn, like your, the grass is cut short and there is a lot of sunlight exposure, usually they are not going there. Um, Jackie writes, what are the rates of spotted Rocky Mountain fever in American dog ticks here in Nova Scotia? Um, I don't have this data. Probably it's some, it's an information that can be found on the Nova Scotia web website. Uh, it's where I, I, I got the information from the map and the black leg tick. Um, yeah. So. Great. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more, Nicola. Yeah. Um, so Tracy writes in, uh, how effective is tick repellent on your clothing versus compared to applying a product onto your skin? So um, if you apply a regular repellent product, um, I would say that um, it will be more or less the same. Um, there are specific products that are meant to be applied just on your clothing um, and they need to be applied uh, not when you're wearing them. For example, there are permetrin clothing spray that you treat your, your pants and your trousers and everything. You wait that they dry out and then you wear, all, you wear it on the top. But for a body spray repellent product, I would say you can apply still on your skin or directly on your, on your sweater. Great. Um, and I will also mention anyone that does not have uh, or had their questions answered or had some future thoughts, um, they're more than welcome to send us an email, uh, which can be found on any of our media platforms. Um, Dr. Nicoletta Ferroni also mentions her uh, email in her slides as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, time permitting, I'm sure would be glad to answer all those um emails. Um, so on behalf of the entire Feeds Needs team, we would like to say thank you for joining us and a very special thank you to Dr. Farone for her amazing expertise and time with us tonight. Um, for those hoping to re-watch the webinar, a recording will be available on our website and our Facebook page in the coming days. Uh, be sure to check us out on social media for more future events, contests, giveaways, and promotions. Uh, thanks everyone and please have a good evening. <laughs>